our job is ab about trust, then skills. First, they have to trust you, otherwise your skill is nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three, so we're doing live face-to-face -face interviews. We're in Verona at the European Academy's annual course, and I've managed to nail down a guy who I've been wanting to interview for quite a while, Serjan Gore. Welcome. My pleasure, my pleasure, Cameron. Thanks for your invitation. And I was watching you and I was just making some, you know, uh, trying to find some place here to, to speak to you about rhinoplasty in your channel. And it's my pleasure for this invitation. No, dude, it's really, I mean, I, I so appreciate the time out of a busy schedule. So I want to kick it off. Eh? So when I first wanted to go and learn from a master overseas, I picked up Sclafani's book on rhinoplasty and I found there was a guy in Izmir. And I thought, what a place. I'd love to go to Izmir. So this guy, Fazal Apaydan, then I email him, he invites me, and the day before I land, he asked me for my hotel booking, and I was like, uh, he says, listen, Cameron, you're 500 kilometers away. I was like, oh dear. <laughs> but anyway, that's where it all started for me, in Izmir, and that's where you're based. Eh? Yes, I am based in Izmir. I do my surgeries there. Sometimes live surgeries everywhere, yeah. but otherwise, I do my surgeries in Izmir. It's the third biggest city on the western coast. Yeah. It's a summer city, somehow hotter than the other part of Turkey, and 45 minutes flight from Istanbul. It's, yeah. a, it's a huge city, actually, four and a half million people. Yeah, to me, it's like Cape Town. Yeah, maybe it's similar, yeah. I've never been to Cape Town yet, but maybe okay. one day, yeah. why not? So <laughs> tell, tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself. What was your journey to, to where you are now? So let me start with Mr. Apaydan that you started with because uh, he's my senior professor. I'm also a professor in the same university, Aga University in Izmir. So everything started like with him because he was the pioneer of rhinoplasty in, for years in, in Turkey and also in all over the world. And he was just uh, a mentor for all of Turkish rhinoplasty society. And it's my chance that I started with the same facility to, to work with him, I, to work for him for years. And then I've been to, because, you, you know, in universities you have to do different things also. And uh, besides facial plastics, I, I am doing like a rhinology. I'm a rhinologist also in the university. So I went to Pittsburgh for cranial-based surgery with... Uh, for for uh, some uh, observations and fellowships and yeah. then came back. So I do cranial base, I do sinus surgeries, and I do cancers uh, of rhinology. And at the same time, facial plastics, this is my work uh, point and, and in Izmir. But in private, uh, mostly I'm doing like facial plastics and rhinoplasty. Yes, bro. And, and uh, where do you find time for your social life and your family? And uh, this is a good question for many doctors, actually. Maybe I can ask the same thing to you in return. But generally speaking, uh, our job is uh, we're doing, we're working with people. So you have to give time, sometimes extra time to your patients, not just about the surgeries, before and after the surgeries. Our, our job is about the trust. Yes. And so we have to establish a good relationship with the patients future patients and some of them doesn't come, you know, just give time. Uh, this works like that. And my patients are mostly all over the world. And so they have to trust you more, you know, they don't see you in person. You do video calls, you give time, but still they want to see you're a real person. You have a family, you have a child and you have, you are based in a, in a city and working properly. And we try to show it through the social media and through the friends and many friends are also helping to each other you know yeah. they ask me who am i gonna go and in south africa i say cameron but you for example same thing if someone asks who is good in Izmir, you give my name so when you trust yeah. and we we just uh, support each other and so it started like that and now for the family uh, thank God I have just one child and my, my uh, wife is also a gynecologist oh, wow. and so she understands me and so I think I can give proper at least a high quality time to my family but not 
like it's it's impossible to give hours and hours in that with it. Yeah, it's but really sure, but it's also you you got to I mean you're providing for your family at the same time, you know. Yeah, sure. And so if we don't do this job, we cannot be feel competent, you know. Yeah. So we we feel competent and we can give to the family. Otherwise, it's impossible. So so now there's a question about like so you as a as the professor at university, you're also running a bit of a private practice yeah. as well. But you're also quite involved with teaching and courses, etc. Yes, exactly. So I'm teaching in the university lecturing. I am also taking fellowships from yeah. different countries, the young doctors, let's say, who want So so there there are people all around the world who listen to this podcast. Yes. Is that open for these kind of people who are listening if they can come and visit you or yes, how does that exactly. work? Exactly. And it works like that. They reach to me. Generally I, I use my own social media and okay. And they ha they can find my phone number from friends. They directly contact me. Well, we have a coordinator for that. There are two ways to do it. If they want to do it properly with private and with the university, we have to we have some paperwork for this. Sure, sure. Because it's a official university thing, and so private and university is little more paperwork. But we have a coordination center for this in, for that in the university. It's easy. But for uh, private, just to come and visit private, it's easier. I get the permissions from the private hospital, and then my coordinator arranges everything. We have it for, for everyone to, oh. to feel confident. And uh, how many people do you have visiting on average? Uh, so I have a lot of long-term visitors in the university. Yeah. Uh, they're always with me and Fazl, Mr. Apaiden. And also, I accept every week just one visitor because in the uni uh, in the university and in the private uh, the rooms you cannot put yeah, like yeah. five people exactly. at the same time because I do a job which is revision rhinoplasty and many surgery failures so my patients sometimes concern about the people yeah, inside the rooms understand. actually there is no restrictions for that and in, in like for example in the university there are residents they can come in and go out and for anesthesia also there is students are going in and out. There is no rules for that much people can come in and out. But there are rules for when you want to go inside, you have to obey the rules, just masking and yeah. caps and everything. But I don't want like more than a few people to be in the operating room. Then because and I'm when I'm just doing the surgeries, I cannot talk in person, you know. So it's few pe more than few people, It's it's not something is good. So Surgeon, one of the things I think being in, in Izmir, you've kind of managed to bypass is in Istanbul itself, there are quite a few really big rhinoplasty surgeons. So they're friends, but they're kind of like, yes, there's a bit right. of a competition. Yes, Do yes. you have something similar in Izmir or not really? Yes, sure. Izmir is a big city and there are very good surgeons. And so basically I can tell you the difference in Turkey than other countries is we are giving support to young doctors, you know this very yes, well, absolutely. mostly for free. Yeah. So uh, for years we did this, so that much good surgeons are immersed in, in Turkey. So Turkey became a capital of rhinoplasty. I don't say everything is good, but this is about teaching. Yes. And so uh, I can assure you that there is a lot of good surgeons also in, in, uh, in my city, but not everything is about being a competent surgeon. It's about experience which never comes fast. So when you're, for example, when you're gonna buy a car, it's not about the money. Mostly you ask how many years, like one year a brand if, if it's a car, you concern if it's a good car yes it takes time to people trust that car but it's something like that i'm 45 years old i'm still trying to build my business and and so and make my patients and friends and doctors trust me but you can find very good and experienced doctors in this one yeah sure but it, it's yeah um I'm, I'm flummoxed by some of these answers. It's great. I mean, the, the depth of your wisdom at 45 is great, eh? Oh, really? Yeah, I'm impressed, Brew. Reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, talk to me a little bit about um, 
the other ENT stuff like skull based surgery, etc. Yes, I do a lot of skull based surgery. I'm a very well known skull based surgeon actually in Turkey. I work with many neurosurgeons. First, in the university, we started the endoscopic uh, cranial based center and we worked a lot. Then I just reduced a little bit because I have uh, some juniors working with me, like uh, another associate professor right now, uh, Dr. Göksel Turha, and we're working together, you know, as a, as a center. And then uh, I've been to Pittsburgh for, for some education about cranial-based surgeries. We do cranial-based tumors mostly. Uh, for sure, you know, the, the biggest amount is the pituitary tumors, but every stuff and also the uh, sinus diseases we trade. And also we do a lot of research and like phase three studies and everything about sinus diseases, inflammatory sinus diseases, I mean, and also some malignant tumors in the university. We collaborate with the like big companies in the world, you know, those kind of studies. And so, um, so it's uh, my work is somehow with endoscopes and with face outside, but it's for me, it's not as separating the things, it's for me a collaboration of those things. For example, it makes me more comfortable in heart revisions, uh, like for example, using the flaps inside to bring the blood to the caudal septum and also to close the septum perforations at the same time yeah. and use the endoscopes to get the breathing on, on a better way. So I take it as an advantage for function and function and, and beauty. Uh, but you know, it's not uh, it's not affecting my face uh, surgeries also. Yeah. But making them so, better. tell me a bit more about uh, your approach to septal perforation repairs. Sure, septum septum perforations are generally you know due to sometimes cocaine abuse, sometimes due to bad surgeries. The problem with the cocaine abuse is it makes a perforation but surrounding mucosa is not uh, good also so it's um, makes uh, the, the 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 abuse makes the cartilage very weak so you have to like do proper uh, mostly if even they are primary go with the rib cartilage and do the stuff like that for like surgical perforations they're more posteriorly based it depends uh, if you want to just close it or not. But anterior-based perforations, they cause crusting, bad smell, bleeding, yeah. or the sound, you know, the voice yeah. when, when people yeah. are breathing. It's very annoying. So, and, and then it affects the socializing of people. <clears throat> I do it in the same session. So I do the flaps first. Generally, I use now both sides flaps for big perforations, small ones can handle without the flaps, you know, already. But what I use generally, if I use one side, like the uh, sphenopalatin artery based posterior pedicle flap on one side, the base of the nose, to be able to prevent the complications of, of the donor side, I use anterior retinoid artery based flap on the other side. So. The naked, okay. the naked cartilage is not the same. One naked cartilage is in the posterior of back of the perforation. The other naked cartilage is superior back of the... Uh, so generally I use both flaps and one flap is aligned like uh, horizontally. The other flap is aligned vertically. So they're, they're generally it's, yeah, they're much better for big perforations to close by two, two flaps. Another question, how diverse is the patient population that you're operating in Izmir? That's, I'm, my uh, patient population is all over the world, I told you. Black people, I have patients from Australia, I have patients from Mauritius Island, for example, I have patients from India, I have patients from Korea, I have patients from Indonesia, but my biggest countries, if you ask, where do they come? For sure, 20% is from Turkey and United Kingdom maybe the second and US the third and Bulgaria the fourth, I think so. Wow. But every country we have patients. Not so much South American patients that I have, but Europe and, and US is the 
working horizon. That's cool, eh? Yeah. Wow. And, um, okay, so how does it work with, what's the, the process? If a patient, like, reaches out to you, how do they end up actually getting in on the OR, on the bed? Uh, okay, so how do they reach them? Yes. There are two ways. The first one and the best one is the word of mouth. And so if, if you make someone happy and they send their like, son, friends, neighbors, and this is the best way that you can build your business. You can yeah. rely on that. You can trust. The second one is social media that you cannot trust. Uh, but because this is sometimes hype, many people reach you. But if they see one bad result or they don't like it, let's say, they go away, they fear. I think this is not something you can trust all the way. You can make it much better for your business, but you cannot trust it in this marathon. Yes. So for me to make someone happy properly, do the nose or whatever, and then respectfully, honestly tell everything because our job is ab about trust, then skills. Yes. First, they have to trust you, otherwise your skill is nothing. So I want to build the trust and I want to use my skills and improve it also. And they reach me out through the social media or they reach me through my, my patients or friends like your doctors, they recommend. Because I do a niche job, which is like close to revisions. Not everyone is insisting on that for years and years I'm doing this. So some patients, multiple revisions, which always concern about the necrosis of the skin in their mind, mm -hmm. they may want a closed approach. And some doctors say, like, don't let your nose open again. But this is something, don't get any more surgeries. But the patient is not happy when they are, they get this like this. Okay, don't open this nose, make it in closed surgery. So it's a selling point, yeah. actually, to do to be one of the very few guys I don't know who is insisting on re-revisions in every multiple revision cases and doing it in closed. I don't know too many people. It's a selling point, but at the same time you do it, you increase your experience and you understand there are some advantages and disadvantages also of the surgery. And so now I'm building it for years and years I'm doing. So for example, for the columella, it's very safe and you use the scar tissue, you don't open it again, you can lengthen, you can give back the columella much easier compared to an open surgery. But it's sometimes tricky to do it, to put stitches on top of the nose in contracted skin patients, small nostril patients. But you know, you build your own experience and then you learn how to do it. You change, it's completely different way of doing things compared to open surgeries. I was an open surgeon for eight years. But surgeon, that's fascinating. I mean, we've had like 100 interviews on the podcast. I've yet to meet somebody who says they do closed revision cases with rib. Yes, every time. So when did, what happened? How did you change your, tell us about that's that. An interesting story. My wife will get laughed for this. Uh, okay, my wife had a surgery when we were in the university, okay, like 20 something years before and a professor, and, and, and on those times, it was a Joseph rhinoplasty, and yes. she couldn't breathe. Okay. And then 16 years, she said, I need a revision, but I don't want it with you right now. And then one day she said, next week, I want a surgery with your revision rhinoplasty. I said, okay, why not in 2018 or something? Yeah. 17, I think. And she had a closed Joseph rhinoplasty, I said that, okay, I'm going to try it and close also a revision. I'm not going to open it. I'm going to see because I, I was figuring out what she had. And then I did not close the approach. The she, yeah, no, without the rib. Okay. Because it was a Joseph, there, it was a tension nose, there was a huge amount of septum inside. Oh, really? And it wasn't a saddle nose. Okay. It was patch tip, malposition of cartilages, you know, it's tricky. And so, and she, like, Felt so good, she became very good, very earlier than expected. She's working as a gynecologist. And she said, hey, why don't you do it to everyone? Close surgeries. And I said, I know, okay, I'm gonna try, because on those times- What, what is her name? Uh, Funda. You must call this the Funda approach. Funda approach, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And then I started to do it for 
several cases. Yeah. In the first, it was like six, eight hours. Let me tell you the truth. Every stitch that I tried to put on, it was like three times, four times I was mm -hmm. trying. And then I learned something. You should use your retractors as a like confronting to your needles, okay? You should use your instruments, not give it to the nurse. Yeah. And then it changed everything. I mean, I'm doing it at the retractor one hand and yeah. putting stitches on top. You start to build it differently. So, and your nurse learns it how to help you. And then now they're average four and five hours, um, even with the whole details. So nowadays I'm better. I did maybe more than just rib revisions. I say one t more than 1,000 closed rib revisions last three and three and a half years or something. I think I'm gonna just leave it right there. You guys must ponder that, eh? <laughs> See who else is going to be doing. I'd, I'd love to put a poll out there. No, how many guys have done closed rib revisions? China, <laughs> there's not many, eh? I know Eren Abi, Eren Tashlan is doing sometimes closed revisions yeah. and many other, like Yoksal maybe. And the, but the thing is, not everyone is doing it in closed approach in every yeah. surgery. They, they, I think they select patients. Maybe it's more, it's better. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, for me, now it's, I feel very comfortable in yeah. closed approach in many things. Surgeon Boo, it's lovely to chat to you. This Tildai guy, he's had a lovely time in Verona, yes. been to Lake Gordia. Yeah. <laughs> pleasure yeah, to speak man, to you. Thank you later. so much for, 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 for taking time out to chat to us. My pleasure. Guys, okay. come back next week yeah. again, eh? Yeah. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.